Entschuldigung, ja, auf den ja, Fritsch, der der ist. Mhm. I will demonstrate later on some data on. Neurologist, yeah. And uh, he decided today to give us some uh, overview about the centrogene labs, and uh, maybe he will take so specific areas. He will talk about lysosomal storage disease, or will be. If you are interested, you can quickly yeah. switch. I was more focusing on the whole exome, but yeah. if you would like to have more I on the. Think that would be the best to concentrate on the whole exomes and to look at the facilities and how to improve the surface locally. As we have dealing with this in the last couple but of months. Should I also start with some metabolic topics and lysosomal topics? Or uh, depends on you. What that you are interested? It won't be that much beneficial for the rest. Yeah. We might discuss it later. I okay. know today is the last day in the week, so it might be very difficult. Okay. We need to concentrate on Centro MD and whole exomes processes. Okay. Today. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed your So thank you very much for the kind invitation, also the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm still active as a medical doctor, I'm a neurologist and neurogeneticist and I guess this is really so super important that we are always combining the clinical understanding, the clinical expertise on the one side with the laboratory technology and the fancy methodology we have in the meanwhile on the other side. Therefore I can only congratulate you you did exactly the right decision to merge both parts so closely together because the communication, the dialogue and the discussion of the individual case has really the good basis and a good chance to increase significantly the benefit to the best of our patients. Um, I was told to talk a little bit today uh, on the whole axon sequencing in general so I'm not hammering you too much with the technological details on the one side um, but I would also uh, like to focus on potential pitfalls once we are generating the data and I guess one lesson is really of high importance. It's not the way that the genetic testing is in nowadays a uh, simple black and white story where you can clearly phrase yes that is the case or this is not the case. We have to understand that we are at the very very beginning of an absolutely attractive and challenging journey for the next 10 to 15 years and this is mostly based on two topics. Number one, we are getting based on the CRAE technologies, whole axome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, all of these massive screening technologies or if you're thinking on mass spectrometry screening where we can test for hundreds of metabolic disease in the meanwhile in parallel, you're getting plenty of data. That's not further on the challenge to generate the data the challenge is really to properly interpret the plenty of data and to bring these data in the context of the clinical setting. Number one and number two, what we are also realizing still we are at the beginning because it's like a book written in an absolutely new language where no one is really experienced how to read the language. So we need translational systems and translational systems are sometimes coming more from the lab side, more from the clinical side but only if they are merging together we have a good chance really to reach at the end of the day the highest level of benefit to our patients. Let's start with the actual situation. I would not like to overburden you with too uh, much uh, numbers but let's be please aware that about 3 billion base pairs are describing our genomic environment as human beings resulting in about 200,000 coding axons, resulting in about 30 million of base pairs and typically you can expect to have 4 million benign variants, what means a difference in the nucleic acid sequence compared to a standard DNA sequence and variants we are typically using as a phrase to demonstrate that yes there is a change in the sequence but there is no biological, physiological consequence to the best of our knowledge. That's the first lesson we are learning. Interpretation is changing over the time. And then we have specific, like a fingerprint, roughly about 20,000 specific structural variants per individual. The most important topic now is how can we label whether a single mutation is really causing the disease, is really causing the phenotype, 
It's definitely a little bit like looking for the needle in the haystack. We can generate within three days the entire genome, three billion of base pairs per individual patient. If we are talking a trio analysis multiplied by three, and we have to end up with one or sometimes very few mutations explaining the phenotype, the problem of the patient, and we are coming back with the diagnosis. This is a very, very, very rough diagnostic workflow, and it starts for sure typically with the sample of the patient. In the overall majority, we are starting with the preparation of DNA or RNA, depends on the clinical question, from blood we are getting from the patient. And this is already one of the topics where we have to be aware if the blood is taken in the wrong way, we are aware that EDTA is not really uh, always exchangeable by heparin. By heparin. Yeah, heparin might sometimes inhibit some of the enzymatic reactions we need to do. So please be aware, sometimes the original material affects and interacts with the test you would like to do. Number one and number two, it's the question how to store the material in the proper way, uh, especially if you are sending out materials Typically, you have sometimes higher cost for sending out than for the test itself. So these are all the, the struggles you have to deal with. That's the reason why we were starting from the very beginning on finding a very easy solution for storing the blood and for sending the blood. And this is the so-called filter card format, where you're just putting some drop of blood. You're all familiar with the newborn screening. It's more or less comparable to that format, the only difference we developed a very specific filter paper that allows you at the end of the day to uh, purify, prepare DNA, RNA, small molecules, enzymes. So all of the tests we are offering are based in the meanwhile on this simple logistic solution, the filter card. One drop of blood of the patient is sufficient more or less for all of the tests we are doing. And the wonderful topic of that is once the material is on the surface of the filter paper and you protect it against humidity, that's of importance. So just put it in a plastic bag, uh, then it's stable for years. You can leave it on your desk or you can store it in your archive. If you're interested, go back in your archive. You don't need the freezers. Yeah, so the archiving is very simple and the material is stable for at least 11 years. This is what we have tested for. I'm pretty sure it's even longer. So logistics is of importance, archiving is of importance. Then you're doing all of these fancy technologies. I'm not jumping into the details. This is just a picture of a PCR-free enrichment technology typically being used, for example, with the Illumina platform. And at the end of the day, you are generating the sequences. You have to interpret the sequence in the proper way. And this is really consolidated in the report we are sending back to our clinical partners. And you will see on the left as well on the right two times the word communication. And communication again describes the most important challenge in the entire workflow. If we are not understanding from the lab side, from the very beginning on, what's the burden of the patient? What is the clinical symptom? What is the reason that the clinical colleague is asking for that specific disease? Might be he have lost a little bit the focus on the right disease. Does he need a dialogue for differential diagnosis? But sometimes there is a good reason why the clinical colleague is exactly asking for that disease. We have to understand it. Because the disease he or she is asking for determines what is the proper technology we are using to come back with the best answer. And the best answer is typically a compromise between cost, time, and quality. That's really super important. But also on the other side, the communication is a challenge because we might think from the lab side, we described everything in the report, we made it as simple as possible, but nevertheless, sometimes we have to understand that we are overcrowding our clinical colleagues. Uh, for us, talking on coverage rate, haplotype, allele imprinting, or whatever, normal words, uh, absolutely a routine. For the clinical colleagues, sometimes they are gone last. So we have always to ask ourselves, how can we translate that genetic language in a very well and good understandable language for the clinical colleagues? Because what we would like to address at the end of the day is the patient. The clinical colleague has to educate together with the human geneticist in a proper way the patient, 
and has to able to understand what is the consequence for the family, for the next generation, regarding treatment decisions and so on. So if we are doing wrong in that topic, we might have the risk that we are doing a stupid analysis, we are missing the right interpretation. If we are doing wrong on the right side, we might be not be able to address in the proper way the patient where we have to see the diagnosis and the data uh, being implemented and also coming as a knowledge in the family. I already mentioned the filter cut is so easy, just put the blood on the surface, let it dry for two hours and what we are doing then, spotting some pieces from this dried blood, put it here in the tube and then you can use this for all of the tests I already mentioned, single gene, MLPA, deletion duplication, RNA preparation as well. Surprisingly, the RNA is rather stable in that environment, uh, whole genome sequencing. So whatever you are interested, use that as a format because it massively simplifies the entire logistics. Don't talk further on dry eyes or cooling or all of these high expenses for the Korea. This is really the best solution. Further on, it's barcode labeled, so you always guarantee that you have a clear-cut identification no handwriting, nothing, and you can store it, as I mentioned, for several years on your desk. Let's start with a clinical case. This is a two-month-old male we recently diagnosed based on doing the whole genome sequencing. Clinical problem of that patient was hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and alkalosis, uh, together with failure to thrive. The unaffected parents have been consanguineous and had two more sons that are affected in the similar way. And not a big surprise, this is absolutely a fair diagnosis. The colleagues, based on the hypokalemia and the alkalosis, were thinking about Barter syndrome. However, it had been tested, it was negative for the Barter syndrome. It was done in, a, in an external laboratory, not by us. And then the colleagues were asking for the whole axome sequencing, and the whole axome sequencing was negative as well. And this is just to remind you that the whole axome sequencing is just covering the entity of all of the axons. That therefore, we are calling this whole axon sequencing. But this covers just one to one and a half percent of the entire genetic information. However, to the best of our knowledge, it describes in the meanwhile about 45 to 50 percent of the monogenetic diseases we are actually aware of. But we are also aware that we are missing a little bit more than 50 percent. I'm pretty sure this percentage is increasing because we are learning that we have two topics a little bit overseen and underdiagnosed in the last decades. Number one, mutations within the intronic stretches. Number two, mutations within the regulatory parts of the gene. And this is exactly the case. We did the whole genome for that patient and we diagnosed a, a intronic, a deeply located intronic mutation at the position minus 191 in the SLC12A3 gene uh, and surprisingly, no one would have expected this from the clinical description. This is a Gittelman syndrome patient where we could demonstrate clearly the homozygosity in the index patient, the heterozygosity for the parents. As I mentioned, parents are consanguineous. Uh, and what's super, super, super important, and do me the favor, pay attention always in the future, whenever the laboratory is de describing a mutation, and we clearly described it as pathogenic, ask the lab, What's the evidence that they are labeling this as pathogenic? Because still the overall majority of the actual diagnosed mutations have either never, has either never been described in the literature, roughly 60 to 90% depends on the genes, the mutations we are diagnosing, I will come back to that topic later on, has never been described in the literature, or they have been wrongly described in the literature. Think on classical data banks you are using like HGMD or ClinVar, you can easily calculate the frequency of the so-called mutations in the general population, and this is especially true in the Arabic population, and you are realizing that more than 30% of those called mutations are more frequent than 2 to 3% in the general population. Would you expect that a rare disease, a rare mutation, is existing in a frequency of 2 to 3% in the general population? No. Definitely not. If this would be the case, you can calculate very easily that roughly in about 10 generations, the entire population should suffer from that disease. That's impossible. That's not the case. So whenever a rare variant is more frequent in the population 
than 1%. Uh, and we have only two exceptions, the cystic fibrosis and uh, the um, hemochromatosis, and for some entities, the thalassemia. This is the only exception. But if there is any mutation being described in the literature more frequent in the population than 1%, you should definitely ask yourself, is that really the reason for my disease? So the problem is the interpretation. So whenever a lab is describing this is a pathogenic mutation, ask the lab for the evidence. And this is exactly what makes the difference, the quality in the interpretation of the data. So whenever we are describing a pathogenic mutation, we have good evidence. And this is either we are doing functional studies, it means overexpression of the individual mutation in a cellular in vitro system. We have biomarkers. In metabolic disease, you can take the enzyme as a further parameter. Or you have to go back in the families and do a co-segregation analysis. For sure, all of the theoretical prediction programs, SWIFT, ANOVA, SPM, SAP, these are the normal standards. But even if you're putting all of these theoretical prediction programs together, you will only reach a sensitivity and specificity in the range of 86, 87, 88 percent. So you're definitely missing or misdiagnosing more than 10 percent. And to make this in a better understandable way more transparent, especially the American Society for Human Genetics started creating a classification, as you are totally aware. So that's the reason why I put it here. This is a class 1 mutation. And class 1, that's the easiest understanding, means we have the highest level of evidence that we are labeling this mutation as a causative mutation. But again, ask yourself, ask the lab always, what's the reason, what's your evidence that you're labeling this as a class 1? And on the other side of the line, uh, you could label it as a class 7. We changed, increased a little bit the different classes. So class 7 would mean absolutely clear that this is a benign variant without any functional consequence for the individual patient. If you're interested, you would put these topics all together also for the systematic guidelines for diagnostic next generation sequencing. That's my colleague Peter Bauer, responsible for all of the lab work at Centrogene. So Peter is the senior author of this extremely important paper where we describe all of these uh, topics that are so important for uh, structuring and using the information coming from next generation sequencing. What is the proper test? If there is a patient sitting in front of you, just an example, in the age of 40 or 50, uh, and this is a male patient, and the male patient is demonstrating psoriatic movement disorders, would you ask for whole exome, whole genome? No. I'm pretty sure no. You're absolutely right. Because most likely, and this is the clinical predictive value, is close to 90%, that patient is suffering from Korea Huntington's disease. So instead of asking for whole exome, whole genome, please ask for a simple PCR demonstrating the repeat expansion cost to some 10 to 30 euros in the maximum, and you will get the best answer for that individual patient. If we have mental retardation, being aware that we know in the meanwhile more than 1,100 genes, if we are asking for complex epilepsy, being aware that we know in the meanwhile more than 1,600 genes, having a very complex phenotype combination of different involvement of organs. Uh, these are the cases where you might ask for more complex systems, like, for example, the whole genome, the whole exome, or the panel sequencing. But you have to be aware of the limitations of all of these tests. So the whole genome, together with the whole exome, is covering all of the roughly about 20,000 genes. The gene panel which is always focusing on the key feature of the clinical symptoms, hepatosplenomegaly, cardiomyopathy, ischiosis, so it depends on the leading clinical feature. Could be a very small panel, starting with roughly about 50 genes. Could be a very large panel, talking like the epilepsy panel on close to 2,000 genes. You have to understand two key quality criteria. The number one is the depth. It means how frequently you are sequencing the individual part of the DNA with the next generation sequencing. And these are the minimal standards being described in the paper I shown you before. And this means the whole genome should have at least in 97%, 30x 
as the depth, the, no, sorry, in the mean 30x uh, of the depth, the whole axiom should have 100x, means 100 times you should read that individual stretch, and the gene panel should have 400 times the read for the individual stretch. Number one. Number two, be absolutely aware, whenever we are talking on whole genome, that's not whole genome, we are missing some percentage. And this is not the ignorance of the lab, that is not the stupidity of the lab, this is just the technical limitation. And technical limitation, let me just give you one example, repetitive elements, CAG, 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 make a simple PCR, demonstrate the repeat expansion, as I told you in the Korea Huntings, don't use the whole axon, whole genome, they will fail. They are not able really to resolve these highly repetitive elements. And there are further examples why we are missing sometimes some parts of the individual gene. So be aware, when you're asking for the genome, you will miss some 2 to 3 percent. The percentage is continuously increasing for the stretches where we are getting sufficient information and material and information. But still, we have 2 to 3 percent of the genetic information we are missing. And the report must be transparent in the way, especially in those genes you are interested because of the clinical phenotype of the patient, where we are missing exon 2 of GBA, exon 17 of GLA or whatever. Because you have to understand from the interpretation, did I get 100 percent of the information for the individual gene I was asking for? Or might be there an exon missing? And this is exactly uh, the benefit you might have from the panel sequencing because for the panels the quality is much more better. Typically if the panel is very well designed, the panel gives you 100% of the information. So you have to decide less information because we are focusing on some of the specific gene or higher level of quality. This is always the compromise you should try to think about what's more of importance at the individual stage for the individual patient. So this is a, an example. Uh, patient was sent to us for the question mental retardation. The deletions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that hint. Yes. Next generation sequencing is, to phrase in a simple way, it's getting better with the new bioinformatics software. It's not really able to detect deletions. Yeah. yeah. That's really, thank you very much. That's really an important. Yeah, very important. Yeah. We do have covers of uh, like the uh, the Which syndrome? Which syndrome? Okay. Mm -hmm. This or, or, because it's not always so clear in what direction you should th ask for the specific gene, or ask for the combination of high resolution CGA array yeah, together with the next generation sequencing. This would be my recommendation in that case, but it's always a clear cut rule. The more specific you are asking for, the more specific the analysis can be done from the laboratory and the more likely you will get the best quality. Yeah. Still, whole exomal genome are screening technologies. We have to be absolutely aware. So if a laboratory sometimes is not detecting the technology, it's not necessarily an argument against the laboratory. It's sometimes just the limitation of the technology. So the more precise you can be, typically the more money you can keep in your pocket, because the less money you have to spend, and typically, the better is the information quality. But you're only getting a small, small, small part of the information. So if you are gone lost because you have no idea on the differential diagnosis, then for sure you have continuously to increase. And sometimes it's at the end of the day, even a stepwise topic, that you are starting with a single gene because you're totally convinced this is metachromatic leukodystrophy or whatever. And surprisingly, that was not the case. Then you're jumping in the gene panel sequencing. If the gene panel sequencing is negative, 
then you have good arguments sometimes to go in the exome and all the genome. Yeah. So still we have to be aware that sometimes because of the cost argument, there is a good rationality to do the analysis in a stepwise <coughs> process. That's for sure clear. But you are absolutely right, it underlines again the importance close interaction between clinical experts and laboratory experts. Just sending a material without a good clinical description reduces the likelihood that you will get a good answer from the lab. That's for sure absolutely clear. So coming back to that example, sample was sent to us. Unfortunately, the, uh, the guy being responsible for the documentation was not really totally aware. So the clinician was clearly re uh, writing, this is a fragile X syndrome, do the whole exome sequencing. Was totally rubbish to do in that case the whole exome sequencing. That's for sure very clear. And do you know why? Uh, there is a test for 20 euros existing, number one, and number two, that's the reason why I'm demonstrating this. This 5 prime UTR region, where we can expect the repetitive element to explain the fragile X, there are no reads from the whole exome. So not a big surprise, uh, the whole exome was negative. And this is a good example how important it is to understand what's the reason that the clinical colleague is asking for on the one side, and what's the best laboratory test that should be able to give exactly an answer to that. However, we have sometimes also for sure that there are clinical sensitivity topics. And whenever we are talking on sensitivity in the complex topic of whole exome whole genome, we have to discriminate sensitivity in the laboratory, in the technology environment, and sensitivity once I'm translating that information in the clinical setting. I can produce highly sensitive, highly specific, highly reproducible technical data that might be without any consequence for the patient. That's what I label with clinical sensitivity. Especially the panel composition, when you are asking for panels, is really a big, big miracle and a big, big dark hole because some labs are offering you, I have 500 genes, I have 1,000 genes, I have 2,000 genes. And if you are really going through the details, you are realizing that 80% of the genes they are depicting in their panels have nothing to do with the key feature you are interested in. Sometimes you find mental retardation genes in hepatosplenomegaly panels. Is there a rationality? Nothing. It's just to argue, I have more genes. So it's not the topic of the size of the gene, it's really the clinical sensitivity of the individual panel uh, you should be interested in ask for. I would not get crowded with a mental retardation gene if I'm asking for hepatosplenomegaly. It doesn't make sense. This creates problems, this creates a burden on the shoulder of our patients because we are generating rubbish data without any benefit for my patient. So the specificity is also a tricky story. We're all aware that there are false positives because you're using the wrong technology. Sometimes we have amplification artifacts. PCR is a wonderful technology. However, we're all aware PCR might create artifacts, monoallelic amplification. You're missing the second allele. You're misincorporating during the enzymatic reaction and you are amplifying this misincorporated uh, nucleotide we are creating mapping artifacts in the next generation sequencing environment. We have the topic of incidental findings. We don't know how to interpret the data. And for sure we are using, this is the most important topic, in the majority wrong classifications, either because they are referencing to very low quality data published in the 80s and 90s, where unfortunately typically the erratum is missing in the journal, so you trust the data. But if you're experienced, you absolutely know this is rubbish, that what has been published there. I already mentioned the high frequency of some of the so-called mutations in specific ethnicities. Be aware that the majority of the genetic data are coming from the Caucasian population. Uh, this is the publication bias. Europe and US are typically most uh, in the forefront for publishing the data. What about the Arabic population? What about the Arabic genome? What about the Japanese, the Hispanic, Franco-Canadian? We're all aware of significant differences. And then for sure this result immediately also in the wrong assumption of the potential pathogenic mechanism in your individual patient. And there is a further topic we have to be aware. The more we are doing whole exome, whole genome, especially in ethnicities 
where we are aware that there is high level of consanguine energy, we can expect that there are two diseases. Uh, and therefore, this was just such an important paper coming from a Chinese-Japanese group uh, being located in the US, publishing in the New England Journal some three years ago, demonstrating the first time that you might have patients with several diseases. And I will show you later on some of our experience in example exactly in that direction. And if you're not paying attention again to the clinical phenotype, and the clinical phenotype is so important, then you missed the right second diagnose, being aware that there might be two, sometimes even three diagnoses. The most important and most challenging topic, I have phrased it several times, is the proper interpretation of the data you have generated. And this is the topic of classification of your mutations. Still, and we have to be aware, the majority of our mutations are labeled as WUS, variant of unclear clinical significance, or in our addiction, and also the majority of the papers using that, a class three, which means actually I have no evidence whether I should label this as a pathogenic or whether I should label this as a benign variant. The more experienced the laboratory is, the better they can reduce the percentage of the WUS, because the WUS are typically generating burden to our patients. Because the clinician is sitting in front of the patient and has to tell the patient, thank you very much that you spent $1,000 out of your pocket for the genetic testing. I can't tell you anything because I can only repeat what's been given here, might be or might be not. That's not satisfying for the lab. That's not satisfying for the human geneticist, for the genetic counselor. That's not satisfying for the clinician. Definitely not satisfying for the patient. This is one of the reasons, and this is therefore I really, really appreciate your approach to centralize also in the future here in your wonderful country, the genetic testing in the future. Size makes the difference. The more patients you are diagnosing, the more patients specifically you have in front of you, uh, the better are your interpretational skills. The better you can comment, this is really a causative mutation, or no, this is a benign variant. But still we are in the phase for the next 10 to 15 years uh, where we have to put more and more evidence together to decide whether it's pathogenic or whether it's benign. However, also for this class three, and I'm not going too much into the details, we have been also part of a completely new classification. Uh, so we have to subclassify the class threes a little bit more. These are extremely important classifications because it has one consequence. We have always to ask ourselves from day to day, from week to week, to from month to month, once we have sent out the report, is there any new evidence that I have to reclassify that variant? Do I have a new evidence that now I can clearly label this as a class one, causative, pathogenic, to have now new evidence that this is a benign variant without any consequence. This is a must. And again, ask your lab whether the lab has found a solution for the continuous reclassification process, which should be part of the entire QM process, number one, and how they are communicating this to their partners. This is really of high importance. Demonstrated here in the very simple cartoon, the generation of the DNA, the RNA sequence, or take the mass spectrometry for the metabolics as well as a basis for that, that's rather easy. The interpretation is getting more and more thrilling and more and more important. One of our answers to find a solution for that is a very, very systematic mutation database where we put together from the very beginning on all of our data, now resulting in a little bit more than one million cases, now we can label this really as the world's largest mutation database for rare diseases. But it's not just the quantity, even though the quantity is of importance. It's really the quality. Because for these cases, we can definitely define each individual case having been curated from an independent team, not being involved in the genetic routine process, revalidating each individual case, putting together all of the arguments, 
Sometimes we have overexpression in V2 assays, sometimes we have biomarkers, sometimes we have enzymes, sometimes we have family data, sometimes we have the fact that we could demonstrate in several patients that this is really the causative element. So we are putting together all of the evidences why we label this as a class 1, a class 2, or class 7, or whatever. Number two, a mutation repository is more or less nothing if you are not combining this with a good clinical description of the individual case. And therefore, only the bridging between genetics and the clinical topics, that's really driving the benefit and the advantage to our patients. And the clinical data we put together on a very systematic uh, data bank, is, which is based on an HPO human phenotype ontology, where we are systematically describing all of the clinical features we have in our hands. So let me come back to an example of next generation sequencing. We did, in that case, the whole genome, resulting in three billion of base pairs. We could sort out and demonstrate that in about 60,000 variants, we are able to demonstrate these in the individual case. So we are filtering down with the systematic and very challenged in bioinformatics to about 10 variants. And now the problem starts. The last mile is always the hardest. Now you have to demonstrate which single mutation, which single gene you have been detected here really is the most likely one explaining the phenotype of the patient. And this is in the meanwhile so perfectly answered in more than 70% with a mutation database. If you have diagnosed 5,000 patients with Pompe disease, several thousand with Cauchy, thousands of patients with metachromatic lobe dystrophy, plus, 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 then it's rather easy, rather easy to diagnose the next one because you have the knowledge in your data bank. That's really super of importance. Let me present you at the end some further examples. This is a VAS trio. I would always like to stimulate you. Don't waste your money in single samples. The trio increases the sensitivity, even though it's a little bit more expensive, I'm aware on that, but it increases the sensitivity of plus 14%. So normally we can detect, diagnose roughly about 28 to 30 percent single cases. You are in the range of 45 percent. If you are just adding the material from the parents, think on the de novo mutations, much more credible, much more informative, or think in the level of the consanguinity of all of the situations where we have a homozygous mutation in the index and the heterozygosity in the parents. However, this is a two months old male. This is an important tool we developed in the last months. We call it Centro ICU because we are realizing, especially in the neonatal ICU, we have significant percentages of babies, of newborns, very young children, suffering from very severe diseases, typically based on metabolic diseases or encephalopathy or epilepsy, typically misdiagnosed, number one. We have an increasing of percentage of those diseases that can be treated, number two. And for sure, each individual day where the baby has been treated at the ICU really costs significant money. So also cost-wise, there is a good argument, not only prognosis-wise, really to come as quick as possible to the result. This test has been done within seven days, so the turnaround time is of high importance. So coming back to the case, two months old male, Delayed motor and language development, intellectual disability, muscular hypotonia, neonatal seizures, some dysmorphic features. Patients have been unaffected, non consanguineous, no other affected siblings. We did the analysis and we could demonstrate in an unexpected gene, the PAX1 gene, a de novo mutation, a heterozygous mutation at the given position here, causing a mental retardation type 17, autosomal dominant one. And only some very, very few cases have been described in the literature. However, this case could be solved rather easily by us because on the one side we have an in vitro overexpression system and on the other side exactly that mutation had been described in the literature. So this mutation could be easily labeled as, yes, it's a pathogenic mutation, it's a class 1 mutation. Further case, six, month, six months old female, also at the neonatal ICU, global developmental delay, central hypotonia, joint hypermobility, and lactic acidosis, consanguinity of the parents, diseased female sibling with more or less the same phenotype, 
in the brain ultrasound, there was the demonstration of cystic changes. We did the whole axome trio, and again, FBXL4 gene demonstrated this uh, stop mutation uh, resulting in a truncated protein, index homozygous, parents are heterozygous, resulting in a phenotype being named as mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome type 13. Important because actually there is a clinical study in Canada uh, running for the specific treatment of this type 13 for DNA depletion syndrome. So we had the chance to bring the parents in contact with a biotech company in Canada uh, and they are just trying to enroll the baby in that clinical study. Again here we have an overexpression system. It's a truncating protein, it's a truncating mutation and that mutation has been described in the literature. So again, this was easy, easy to label this as a pathogenic class one mutation. And as I mentioned, you will see increasing numbers of cases with more than one mutation. Uh, yeah? Okay, this case is the replacement, the replacement case. There is a lot of flu of mitochondrial disease, clinical cause, because there is congenital lactic acidosis and there is multi-systemic involvement and also some remnants of the brain anomalies. Shall we go ahead with the mitochondrial disease parents or we should record for it? Um, this depends a little bit again on the clinical phenotype on the one side and the pedigree analysis. Normally I would always recommend start with a mitochondrial panel because again the more precise you're asking the better is the quality. Uh, therefore the more you are convinced that this is really mitochondrial please start with a mitochondrial. That's for sure very clear. It's more or less the same answer as I already gave you 10 minutes earlier. The more precise you can ask for the single gene. Yeah. No. 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 More or less equal. But again, what's really of importance to understand is the quality is higher, yeah. but you are getting less information. So this is always the compromise. Actually, you have to find at least for the next two to four to five years. Yeah. With the further dramatic reduction of the price of the whole genome sequencing yeah. price, with the knowledge that whole genome is a non-PCR based enrichment and amplification system quality and knowing that we will solve more and more with the bioinformatic all of the actually not addressed stretches of the DNA I am pretty sure in five years the answer will be different in nowadays please do me the favor try to be as precise as possible from the clinical but also from the laboratory side it's not always necessary to directly jump in the whole exome whole genome yeah. Okay, important for that five months old female was the fact combination growth, retardation, and immunodeficiency. So the case was sequenced, bioinformatic went back. I saw the case, and they had been happy. They told me, yes, we detected this very rare mutation in the INSR gene. Uh, so it's a Danahue syndrome. Uh, again, we have a functional assay, number one, and we have diagnosed some patients from the Latin American family. So we feel very comfortable to phrase this as a clear-cut pathogenic in class one mutation. But I phrased, guys, didn't you see the information of immunodeficiency? That's not fit with the syndrome diagnosis. So how should we explain the immunodeficiency? There is more in that case. So they changed the filter, they changed again the entire filtering process, and then immediately they popped up. And this again underlines the importance. Information of the clinical details is super important. And then it popped up that there is a second diagnosis uh, present, again, a truncating mutation resulting in the immunodeficiency uh, uh, type 28. Super important because it has a specific therapeutic consequence to the individual patient. So do me the favor, don't understand this, that the lab is pressurizing you or squeezing you to get more data. The better the lab is informed regarding the clinical picture, the better will be the answer at the end of the day. I will jump over some slides, but I guess it's of important to demonstrate to you this slide. What, it's always of importance to analyze individual cases, but then for sure you have to jump in science and research. So what we did, and just yesterday we got the approval for publishing, uh, this is a, a manuscript where we are describing the first 1,000 whole exome families based on 3,000 whole exomes we did. 
and I'm not going to the much into the details, but just demonstrating you three numbers. Number one is roughly 30% of the patient could be clarified rather easily because we had evidence that in these 30% of the cases we either find a class 1 or a class 2 mutation. Uh, so it means clearly proven or very likely that this is the causative mutation. 60% of these mutations have never been described before. Uh, so again, size makes the difference for your laboratory partner. Additionally, 25% are class 3 variant of unclear clinical significance. Now you have to work on the topic how we are able to define further evidence whether this has to be reclassified as class 1 or 2 in the future or whether this has to be reclassified as a class 6 or 7. From the preliminary data, and I, uh, as I mentioned, we are very, very convinced that functional assays will really give us a lot of insight in the pathophysiology and the consequence of the individual mutation, overexpress the mutation, analyze the functional system. From the preliminary data, I guess it's rather likely that roughly about 80% of the 25% will result in the reclassification of class 1 and 2. Put together the 30%, put together the 80% from the 25, more or less 20%, means actually with good clinical information, we can solve up to 50%. And this is a very simple analysis that shows you one important topic. If you're only paying attention to the clinical information, and this is re being represented here in the numbers of the HPO terms, which means did I get just one information, epilepsy, cardiomyopathy, ischthyosis, whatever, or did I get an entire portfolio spectrum of the broad clinical picture of the patient? More than 15 HPO terms we are translating from the clinical information we got. Determines whether you have a success rate for the whole exome of 30% for the class 1, class 2, or whether you will result in 41%. You didn't do any further test, you didn't spend any further euro in that. Just sending better clinical data to the lab increases plus 11% of the clarification rate of the individual case. So do me the favor, whenever the clinicians are talking with the lab, ask for as precisely as possible the clinical data because they will influence the filtering process, the entire bioinformatic process, and also the final interpretation of the data. I will skip the metabolic slides. Maybe we can discuss it later on. Maybe this is my last slide. Whole genome sequencing is without any doubt in complex phenotypes and difficult differential diagnosis. In the meanwhile, the top number one genetic diagnostic tool. That's for sure clear. We are underestimating, but we didn't have the chance technologically wise in the last decades, the importance of intronic and promotor mutation. So what we did is we analyzed whole exome negative cohort of a little bit more than 500 cases and reanalyzed these cases with the whole genome. And we have been able to demonstrate that we could clarify additionally 18%, 1,8%. Because these are intronic or regulatory mutations. So it means uh, whenever the exome is negative, I've shown you the first case exactly resulting in that case, there might be a good argument to jump in the whole genome. However, ask yourself, isn't there an easier test? Isn't there a more informative test? Think on Correa Huntington, think on the mitochondrial, and think on the fragile X I've shown to you. Differential diagnosis is always super important. The better the differential diagnosis has been discussed with the lab, with the experts, typically results also an improvement of the positivity rate of our patients. Have a very strong partner, either you use CentraMD or have a strong lab using CentraMD because it's the largest repository actually for the interpretation of the data. That's for sure very clear. And if you are putting together actually all of the knowledge, you should already nowadays reach about 50% of positivity rate for the whole genome diagnostics and I guess the most significant improve will come in the next 6 to 18 months from the continuous improvement of the bioinformatics because the filtering pipeline, the filtering algorithms are getting better and better, especially the CNV topic will be addressed in the next months on the one side, 
and also the deletion and applications will be addressed much more better based on the new bioinformatic pipeline. Thank you very much.